ready to start. Let me close this out. I hope everything is in accordance with um, the way it should be. So let's start with prayer, shall we? If you're able, please kneel with me. Father, we are thankful that we can come from far and near and be together to study your word. So we plead with you and ask for you, from you the gifts of the spirit of understanding, discernment, um, knowledge, wisdom. Teach us, Father, through your spirit. And may your angels draw near as we read or heard read to us earlier that we're never alone. Your angels are our companions and we want to worship you in the spirit of truth and with these heavenly angels, may we all bow our knees and our hearts to your goodness and your mercy and your love. And teach us now, I pray, from your word and be with every heart that's with us, every burden that's carried on these hearts. We lay them at your feet, knowing you have the answer. So please open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon us, yes, and upon these needs that we carry around. Um, but we know that we tr can trust you and have faith to work out everything to your good pleasure. Be with those who are ill today also, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now you'll need your Bibles, Leviticus 4, we're going to be reading from. Let me open the lesson. And I wish, <laughs> in, a, in a lot of ways, I've built some of this lesson so that you can answer the questions before um, we dis I discuss the answers. So the slides are built that way. It would be nice if you could just open up your um, Mike and tell us the answers, but we're going to, lesson six is about some of the offerings of the sanctuary service. Um, in particular, when um, the priest, the congregation, the ruler, and a person sins, what happens? Well, how did God address that and teach the people to address it. And then it closes with the Day of Atonement. But before we do that, let's review a little bit of what we've already covered in our lessons in the past six, seven lessons. First of all, that there are two sanctuaries. I know you know this, but do you know where you can find the text? Text plural, that tell us this. But there are two sanctuaries the Bible speaks of, the earthly sanctuary, or i.e. worldly, and the heavenly one. Exodus 25, 8 and 9, uh, talk about let them build me a sanctuary. So that's the earthly one that was built through God's directions, through Moses, to these workmen that were given skill, wisdom, and knowledge to do this. So, yes, there's a heaven, uh, a earthly, worldly one. And then Hebrews 8, 2 and 9, 1. Let's just open there. We'll be going back and forth between Hebrews and Leviticus 8, 2 states, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. And then looking over to 9, 1. Is it 9, 1? yes. There, then verily, the first covenant also had no ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. So, um, yes, the Lord pitched this. It says the next icon or uh, group. One was a type. No, I didn't read. One built by Moses, the other by God. Next review, one was a type. The example and shadow of heavenly things, that's Hebrews 8, 5. And the other, the antitype, the true tabernacle that we just read about in 8, 2, Hebrews 8, 2. Now, the services of the earthly were performed by the Aaronic priesthood. But the heavenly, by Jesus Christ, going on in the earthly sanctuary, the blood of animals was offered daily as a type of the sacrifice of Christ. In the heavenly, Jesus presents his own blood 
as the sacrificial atonement for the sins of the people. Going on, now we read Exodus 25, 8 and 9. Of the earthly tabernacle, the Lord said to Moses, Let them make me a sanctuary. I think I might have said build before. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I shew thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. That was the directions for the earthly one. And then in Hebrews 8, 1 through 5, we read, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, whereof it is of necessity that this man have some what also to offer, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern, shewed thee in the mount, shewed to thee in the mount. And so here again is a um, comparison or a just juxtaposition of the earthly and the heavenly. Now we're moving on into our lesson for today about its services. Not all of its services, but some of them. We're going to focus on them. And if you've been through the lesson, you know all the answers. But let's just review the questions like one, 1 through 6 or 7. If a priest sinned, what offering was, he, was required of him? What was first done with the offering? What was done with the blood? If the whole congregation sinned, what service was performed? When a ruler sinned, what offering was required of him? When one of the common people sinned, what choice was given him? in making an offering, and then what promise was made to those who brought the required offering. So here on the left in red, I've summarized, we're going to look at the priest, the anointed priest. The Bible says the anointed one. Here is just a priest. But for clarity, it's not just a common, like a common person, a common priest. The anointed priest, the definite article is used, not indefinite article and that makes a lot of people believe that this part of scripture is talking about the anointed high priest but nevertheless it's the priest congregation ruler and person now let me see what i have coming up next yes the anointed priest leviticus 4 2 let's read that speak We've already read it, but let's read it again. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, if the priest that is anointed, and it goes on, we'll read more in just a minute. Now, so this part is talking about the anointed priest. but. Before we consider this, I want to remind you that the sanctuary and the vessels of the sanctuary were anointed also. Exodus 30, 25 through 30 states, And thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound, after the art of the apothecary. It shall be an holy anointing oil, and thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith and the ark of the testimony and the table and all his vessels and the candlestick and his vessels and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels and the laver and his foot and thou shalt sanctify them that they may be most holy 
whatsoever toucheth them, toucheth them shall be holy. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, just think for a minute. The tabernacle, all the vessels inside and out, were anointed. They were anointed with this special anointing oil. They were holy. And how could priests officiate at them if they haven't been anointed and set aside, sanctified, made holy through this anointing process? I know they're human, and that's why we have this sin offering we're going to talk about. But they... The priests that used these vessels that officiated in the holy place and once a year in the most holy place, all of this is set aside to be holy. Now, there's one other thought I want, you, I want to bring before you before we move on. There is no sanctuary now. We've mentioned this in the past. There is no temple now destroyed in AD 70, the la, you know, the last destruction. Um, so think about these Israelites encamped around the sanctuary, orderly campment. And as um, someone sinned and brought an offering to the gate there, the doorway in at the, um, uh, the enclosure, and they came into the courtyard, brought their offering, placed their hand on the head of their offering, and sacrificed it. Um, this, was, this was a reality to these people. They lived what we're studying about now. They lived it. They um, breathed it. It was, it, it, we call it the economy. It, it was their, um, their lifestyle revolved around all of this and now it's nothing is being done it's not part of the jewish lifestyle of course the um, curtain was rent at the death of christ we understand that but it's important to us now how they lived how god directed how he set apart the services the the uh, vessels the um clothing of the priests how he made all of this uh, and showed it to Moses as the pattern. That was, that was for the people then, yes. But it's for us today, and it's been for God's people since um, the destruction of Jerusalem. As they've studied it, Hebrews explains what happened, Jesus, when he ascended, all of that. It's for them, but it's especially for us because of what happened in 1844 and the understanding that was granted to God's people, that little flock. We, we heard about the little hummingbird, that little flock that was confused yet knew God and knew they something went wrong and they searched and prayed about it and God instructed them. And but, and so this knowledge of the sanctuary, what the Israelites lived, breathed, and, in, um, and um, worked in, that economy of how God dealt with sin and what the sacrifices represented, that was all a reality to them. Now in symbol, it's a reality to us, and it's a vital reality to us. We need to understand it and realize where we're living in the course of history and uh, the timeline to the end when this great controversy will be over. So the sanctuary, the vessels, the um, furniture, were all um, anointed. So was Aaron and his sons anointed. And now we get to this anointed priest. Let's read the whole section, Leviticus 4, <clears throat> verses, pardon me, 3 through 12. 
If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, we'll get to that phrase in a minute, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned. What was he to bring? <laughs> this is where I just have one. What's the first step? He was to bring, this anointed priest was to bring a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering going on. And verse 4, And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head, and kill the bullock before the Lord. Verse 5, And the priest that he is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. We'll explain that. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord before the veil of the sanctuary, i.e. separating holy and most holy place, going on seven. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all of the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle, of the congregation, and he shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, that's a fatty, fatty appendage above the liver, that fatty part was to be taken with the kidneys, and it shall he take away, as it was taken off from the bullock of the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar of burnt offering, and the skin of the bullock, and all his flesh, with his head and with his legs, with his inwards and his dung, even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp, unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out shall he be burnt do we that's where we quit okay so it's without the camp not without the sanctuary part but without the camp and so if the anointed priest sinned he was to and that would be most likely Aaron is what we're talking about. But his sons were also anointed, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, Ithamar. And um, they, they were, were to bring a young bullock for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lay his hand on the head of the bullock and kill the bullock. The priest was to take of the blood, dip his finger in it and sprinkle the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary and place blood on the horns of the altar of sweet incense and pour all of the blood left over at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering, which is the door of the tabernacle, and then um, uh, take all the fat, I read, the two kidneys, the call, and um, burn them on the burnt offering, and then carry everything else out. Out of the camp to the place where the ashes were deposited and burn that um, there. Now, in Leviticus, remember I said we would discuss soul sin and um, um, that involuntary, uh, I, the sin that, how does the Bible, let me go back. Oops, I lost my place. Just a Ignorant, the ignorant sins. The word sin in Leviticus 4 is used 25 times. The root occurs about 580 times in the Old Testament and is thus its principal word for sin. I'll give you the Hebrew word in a minute. The basic meaning of the root is to miss the mark or away. Now, soul that we read, if a soul shall sin, that word soul means the inner self. If you sin ignorantly, you are, uh, it means the inner self or the life, the soul, 
and I have references, and I know we're going to run out of time. So let me just leave the references there, One, two references, or three, uh, out of many. Genesis 23, 8, and Genesis 27, 4, for that inner self. I can't speed through this. Let's just do it. Genesis 23. You, we, we'll miss the lessons. That might speak to your heart if I step over this. 23, 8. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephraim, the son of Zohar. So if it be your mind, if it be your soul, it's the same Hebrew word. And so this soul is the inner, inner self, the inner mind. And we also read this in 20, about this in 27.4. Let's look at that. And make me savory meat. This is um, Jacob talking to, no, Isaac talking to um, Esau. And make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless thee before I die, my soul, my mind, my thoughts in my mind, that I can bless you. And then it also can mean life. Let's look at Genesis 19.17, which states, And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, for thy soul. Same Hebrew word. Look not behind thee. This is at Sodom. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest thou be consumed. Escape for thy life. Escape for thy soul. So, if a soul shall sin, if, if this life, if a being a person shall sin. A person who has life shall sin. Now that word for sin means an act that transgresses something forbidden. To be wrong, to offend, to sin. We read about this also in Genesis. Let's look at 4.7. If thou doest well, of course this is Cain, God speaking generously to Cain, um, speaking kindly, trying to teach him. Who was there that would teach him? God himself did this. Of course, this was Jesus Christ as God. But here, uh, verse 7, If thou doest well, and 6 says, And the Lord said unto Cain, If thou doest well, thou shalt, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. He's instructing him. Yes, sin lieth at the door, but you're to rule over that sin. So that's um, uh, something that Cain did wrong. He offended. Let's look at Genesis 18. There's so much I want to cover. The, the meat is coming up, but these are important thoughts. Verse 20 states, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Behold, I have blessed him. In, hmm, let's see. This Am I in the right one? Nope, wrong chapter. 1820 states, sorry. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, that is the same. They, these acts, these transgressions, the things forbidden, and we know it was a very wicked place. Now, ignorance. Back to Leviticus 4, we read, about ignorance. Verse 2. If a soul shall sin 
through ignorance. And that Hebrew word ignorance means unintentional, inadvertent. Uh, um, the RSV calls it, instead of ignorance, unwittingly. If he sins unwittingly, unknowingly, um, it's an unintentional, I hate to use the word mistake, but that's how others describe it. It's an unintentional sin. We kind of gloss over it and say, well, we made a mistake or we slipped, and it's true. We do that. But let's remember they're all grievous sins to our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ and to the holy angels going on. Now, this sin through ignorance, ignorance I know I brought it up in the past, recent, recent past, past that um, Jesus prayed. In Luke 23, 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And I just want to stop there for a minute. Perhaps you have known people, perhaps even yourselves, have didn't want to know something because if they knew it, to be responsible for God, it would require change. So don't tell me, I'd rather not know, I want to be ignorant. But that doesn't fly with God. If you have the opportunity to know and you refuse, you turn your back, you say, I don't want to know and then I won't be guilty. That's not true. Because God looks at this ex type of experience as uh, uh, as you have the ability to know and you refused it. And politically speaking, in our world today, in the evil in our world, you can think of um, ways that things are done where I don't want to know what you're doing because if I know what you're doing and I'm called before a court of law, I will have to say, so don't tell me. I don't want to know. I just need to know what I'm doing and uh, and you put blinders and you close your eyes. This doesn't fly with God in the secular world or in the spiritual world. If you have the opportunity to know truth, uh, let's just think about the Sabbath. If you have the opportunity to know that the Ten Commandments are still um, viable and we are uh, um, required to up. Uh, uh, mold our lives after them, to obey them. And, you know, we might obey all of them, but the fourth commandment, and I don't want to know about the Sabbath. My whole family worships down the street at this Sunday church. This, we can't have that mindset. But Jesus still said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, in Desire of Ages 744.2, Christ pitied them in their ignorance when he prayed this. And guilt. He breathed only a plea for their forgiveness, for they know not what they do. Going on in Desire of Ages. The Savior made no murmur of complaint. His face remained calm and serene. But great drops of sweat stood upon his brow while the so dot, 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 while the soldiers were doing their fearful work, Jesus prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His mind passed from his own suffering to the sin of his persecutors and the terrible retribution that would be theirs, no curses were called down upon the soldiers who were handling him so roughly. No vengeance was invoked upon the priests and rulers who were gloating over the accomplishment of their purpose. Christ pitied them in their ignorance and guilt. He breathed only a plea for their forgiveness, for they know not what they do going on. Had they known that they were putting to torture, one who had come to save the sinful race from eternal ruin, they would have been seized with remorse and horror. But their ignorance 
and I, I think this is probably, I don't know, we'll just, their ignorance did not remove their guilt, for it was their privilege to know and accept Jesus as their Savior. Some of them would yet see their sin and repent and be converted. Some, by their impenitence, would make it an impossibility for the prayer of Christ to be answered for them. Yet, just the same, God's purpose was reaching its fulfillment, and here I want to emphasize Jesus was earning the right to become the advocate of men in the Father's presence. Now, how was he earning the right? She doesn't explain that. But what was going on on the cross? She says he was earning the right to become our advocate. Now, we know from the context that we've just read that he was dying. Of course, he was dying, and he would die in our place. He would give us eternal life, you see. His death covered our sins. So that, that's important. He was, of course, it's everything. He was dying. But also in this context, we read about um, the character that shone forth from his inner being. He made no murmur or complaint. He was calm, serene. He prayed for his enemies. He brought no curses or vengeance upon the enemies. He pitied them. And so he was earning the right to be our advocate by, yes, dying in our place, our substitute, and also showing us the beautiful mind of Christ, that he didn't murmur, complain, um, this is also the mind of our Heavenly Father. He didn't murmur, complain. He was serene and calm through it all. He trusted and had faith in his, his Father and our Father. So he wasn't ruffled or um, in despair over what was happening. He prayed for his enemies. He pitied them. And it's true. Jesus is our advocate. No human being can be the advocate he is. But when we pray, when we pray for others, we're going to our Heavenly Father through, the, um, uh, through Jesus Christ and his worthwhile life. Ours is not worthwhile. We're, we're trying to to be like Jesus right now, today. I know that is true for each one of you because you're here, not because of me, but you're here to, to um, draw closer to God. And I pray that your time here will do that for you, that your time here will open your eyes just a little more to the grand and glorious a theme of salvation and how it is accomplished. And so, and so when we pray for others, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's um, an acquaintance at work, maybe it's an acquaintance at church, and you know there's a need in a, a brother or sister, and so you are praying to to. For that brother or sister to have the courage, the strength, the wisdom, the knowledge, everything that person needs to face whatever they're facing. Maybe it's a life-threatening illness. There's much of that in this world and in our body of believers. Um, so we can advocate in a small way. And it's only through the merits of Christ that it has any um any weight or any um, uh, power. It's God's, it's the power of Christ that he adds in his intercession with our prayers. So we advocate. And this example, we have to die to self. We have to have the quality that we're not jealous of, of the person we're praying for or that we're not glad 
other person is suffering. All of it is gone. We have no murmur, no complaint. We are calm and serene, trusting in the Father and in Jesus Christ to, to solve whatever we're bringing there. And, and we pray for our enemies. We pity them through God's grace of their ignorance. But remember, being ignorant does not, uh, and sinning does not uh, obliviate the guilt. Let's go on now. According to the sin of the people. What does that mean when we read here? What verse is that in? Verse 3. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people. Well, all sin is sin. His sin is a, he's a person. What does this mean according to the sin of the people? Well, the RSV states that instead of saying according to the sin of the people, you can understand it as saying, thus bringing guilt on the people. You see, this is the high priest most likely being talked about. And if he's sinning, he's a representative of Christ to the people. And if he's sinning, he's bringing guilt onto the people. That's the understanding, the best understanding I know of, of what this phrase means, according to the sin of the people. RSV says, thus bringing guilt on the people. And the Bible comment, SDA, brings that out also. Now, this Hebrew word sin has a, a root and many derivatives all um, chaining to that root. And hata is the the root and it's translated if it's this word hate hate is sin hatata is sinners hatat ah uh, uh, and so forth it, it's all uh, based on this root hata and it means sin or sinners or a sinful thing or a sin offering and so here we have the altar of burnt offering and here we have the laver coming up. Now, now we move into if the whole con congregation sins. Remember, this is an ignorant sin, a sin that uh, they didn't know that they were doing. Same type of offering, a young bullock. But this time, the elders of the congregation placed their hands on the head of the bullock, and the bullock shall be killed, the Bible says. The anointed priest shall bring the blood into the tabernacle and sprinkle it seven times before the veil. Everything stays the same. Um, but I'm not sure about because the anointed priest anointed the altar of incense in the holy place. But the next step I have is the horns of the altar. Oh, yes, in the tabernacle. That's, I was afraid I was had made a mistake. He shall put blood upon the horns of the altar in the tabernacle, i.e. in the holy place, and pour out all the blood at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering. Same thing. Take the fat. And uh, it's stated here, it, let's see, in verse 21. I don't remember reading this part. For the high priest or the anointed priest, but in 20, we read, And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering, so shall he do with this. And the priest shall make an atonement for them, i.e. the congregation, and it shall be forgiven. Now we have this concept added. And then the bullock is carried out, the parts of the bullock, and burned outside the camp. Now, a ruler. A ruler is similar um, 22 and 26, we read about it. I'm not going to read about it now. I'm just going to summarize because we're getting close on time. But the offering for the ruler is a kid of the goats, a male, without blemish. He shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it. it and now the Bible calls it, it is a sin offering. Well, in verse 3, it's to be brought before the Lord for a sin offering, but it's specifically stated about the ruler. It is a sin offering 
The priest shall take of the blood, put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and pour out the blood at the bottom of the altar. We don't read about it being taken in to the holy place and burn all the fat, etc. And the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven. Now, that's all I know about the offering for the ruler. But we do know that when a person not brings in his offering, it also didn't state, if I remember correctly, that the blood was taken inside and sprinkled um, before the altar of incense. But we know that happened, and I'll have different references coming up about that. So that's the ruler, the common person, Leviticus 24, 27 through 31. The offering is a female kid of the goats without blemish or female lamb. He shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat or the lamb and slay it. The priest shall take of the blood with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out all the blood at the bottom of the altar. Take away the fat as done in the peace offering and burn it upon this altar. And the priest shall make an atonement and it shall be forgiven him. Now, let's review before we lose time about what's happening here. And I'm... Some of this is like this one references Great Controversy 418.1. The blood. Now, I just want to stop here. Especially young people, and maybe you, might think, why do we have, or did they have, blood offerings? That seems kind of gross and um, mean to the animals. Why? Remember, it's all... It helped them, yes. It set up an economy, a spiritual economy for the people to live and dwell in at that time. But it's uh, symbolic and vital to us today. But let's read on. This blood, and think in your mind, why do we have to have blood? This blood, the blood, representing the forfeited life of the sinner whose guilt the victim bore, was carried by the priest into the holy place and sprinkled before the blood. Therefore, the ruler, the common person, this is what happened, my words, behind which was the ark containing the law that the sinner had transgressed. By this ceremony, the sin was through the blood transferred in figure to the sanctuary. In some cases, the blood was not taken into the holy place, but the flesh was then to be eaten by the priest, as Moses directed the sons of Aaron, saying, God hath given it to you, given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, Leviticus 10.17. Both ceremonies symbolized the transfer of the sin from the penitent to the sanctuary going on. I think we go on. No, let me just um, stop here for a minute. Now we know that death was the um, consequence of sin. And it started in Eden. And let's just look. I know that you're familiar, but Genesis 2. Is it 2 or is it 3? But of the fruit of the tree, verse 3, 3, 3, in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. That's Eve talking um, the verses up earlier. Lest ye die. The idea was God said, if you do this, you will die. And they did it, and they died. And death is now our portion of life unless we are called to be alive when Jesus returns. Now, so there is death involved with sin. We know that the wages of sin is death, Romans tells us. So um, blood is not unusual. This is a symbolic representation of the work of Christ. Christ took 
our sins with him to the cross. And he died as a substitute for each one of us. But this is symbolized in the services of the sanctuary during the Israel, early Israelite time. And so a blood sacrifice was necessary to teach them that it would be the blood of Christ later that would in reality uh, provide eternal life to them by faith in that blood of Christ, by faith in the power of Christ to overcome sin. And so this was a symbolic ceremony involving real-life animals, but it taught them and it teaches us that the sin uh, was confessed, repented of, the animal was slain, and the blood was carried in. But the reason it was carried in, or eaten by some at, at other times, the reason it was carried in was and sprinkled before the veil is because it represented um, the sin against the Ten Commandments beyond the veil in the ark. They had been transgressed. That blood, even though it was the uh, representing the later blood of Christ, it polluted the sanctuary. Thus, we have to have the Day of Atonement coming up, and we can't possibly get to it. We'll pick up, Lord willing, next time, and I hope you will join us. But it was a symbol, um, this blood, of the blood of Christ, yes, and of the need for the death of Christ because the uh, Ten Commandments had been violated and um, pe people repented of that. And I want to, Leviticus 6.26, the priest offered it for the sin, for sin shall, the priest that offereth it for sin shall eat it. In the holy place shall it be eaten in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation and we'll pick up here. What ministration was performed? I, I just want to read this so we can get through it. Day by day, and, and the book they recommended in 1895, The Sanctuary and Its Cleansing, states, the daily ministration embraced the regular morning and evening burnt offering, Exodus 29, 38 to 43, the burning of sweet incense on the golden altar of incense every morning when the high priest dressed the lamps and every evening when he lighted them exodus 30 tells us that the additional work appointed for the sabbaths of the lord and the annual sabbaths new moons and feasts that's in numbers 28 and 29 besides the particular work to be accomplished for individuals as they should present their offerings throughout the year that's what the daily ministration was and um let me just, one minute. In the sin offerings, this is Patriarchs and Prophets 355.5. In the sin offerings presented during the year, a substitute had been accepted in the sinner's stead, but the blood of the victim had not made full atonement for the sin. It had only provided a means by which the sin was transferred to the sanctuary. By the offering of blood, the sinner acknowledged the authority of the law, confessed the guilt of his transgression, expressed his faith in him who was to take away the sin of the world, but he was not entirely released from the condemnation of the law. On the day of atonement, the high priest, having taken an offering for the congregation, went into the most holy place with the blood and sprinkled it upon the mercy seat. And it goes on. We have to stop. May God bless you. Maybe you can read more about this. I'll make, I'll make this downloadable so that you can study it more, be more prepared for next Sabbath. Lord willing, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word and all these details that we're reading about, about the sanctuary service, the offerings. There's great truth in them, Lord, truth that applies to us today. So help us to value this truth. Help us to become experts.
teach us. You are the best teacher ever. Teach us. And you teach each one individually as only they can understand. Isn't that wonderful? We praise your name. We love you. You are the best. Those are just futile words that a human heart can say. But we join you in our little way with the heavenly host to praise you because you are worthy. Forgive us of our sins, we ask. Cleanse our hearts so that we will rather, would rather die than to sin. Rather hunger and thirst and, and want than to sin and to break your word, uh, your holy words. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And until we meet again, may God watch between us and keep you. Bye for now. <laughs>